All right, everyone, we're going to start the history of photography with me, Imani Haddon. This is week seven, cinematic self-exploration meets tech boom. So this is the 1980s. Let's begin. So my contact information, Imani Haddon Photography. My Instagram is my first name and last name, Imani Haddon. My email is imanihandphotography at gmail.com. I'm available for career building and mentorship for high schoolers in the AV area, so that's Lancaster and Palmdale regions. My background, I have a bachelor's of fine arts in photography and a double minor in art history and a minor in architecture. I do personal and public event photography. I'm also a real estate photographer and a visual artist. So general Zoom meeting and housekeeping rules, please stay muted with your screens off. I'll have questions at the end. There'll be no note taking required, no testing, no homework. Okay, so technology timeline recap. We're gonna begin with 1888, George Eastman markets the Kodak number one box camera. You press the button, we do the rest. In 1895, the Lumiere brothers present the Cinematograph, which is a camera projector and film printer all in one to a paying audience in France. In 1898, Alta Vista introduces the first mass produced American panoramic camera. So this camera had a mechanical piece that swiveled and took pictures in a sequence that allowed them to be put together as a panoramic view. In 1900, Eastman Kodak introduced the Brownie camera at retail price of $1. So this allowed photography to be spread even more than the previous daguerreotypes, albumin prints, calotypes. It made photography portable for the average person and affordable. In 1935, Eastman Kodak introduces Kodachrome. This is the first color transparency film in 16 millimeters. So previously, all images had been in black and white or sepia tones, gray tones. So now color is being introduced in the 1930s, right around the time when films were also becoming in technicolor or a sort of light, off pastel color. Previously, they were in black and white. 1942, Eastman Kodak develops Coda color process for making color prints from the negatives. So each time there is an innovation, they have to then have a developmental process that's developed behind the film so that the colors can become apparent in the photography. So this image is New York Old Theater in 1944. And you can tell this is old film because the colors are muted. They are vintage colors, colors that we are not really seeing today in the here and now. Each era has its own color palette and color theme. So this was the color palette of the 1940s, which was very red reds and yellow yellows and blue blues and all colors were mixed together. As you see with the car, it has the primary triad, red, yellow, and blue here in one vehicle. The signs were also red, yellow, blue, bright green for that era. Okay, so cameras go digital, kinda, kinda. Steve Sassoon of Kodak, he invented the digital camera in 1975. He has his bachelor's and master's of science in electrical engineering from Rensselaer. He is an engineer at Eastman Kodak and his invention has a US patent. So this is the first digital camera prototype. As you see, here's what we've moved on to in the much more recent times. 
It was built in Kodak's Applied Research Lab. It used an image sensor, which is a Fairchild CCD, which is a charge coupled device. It stored 30 images and it took a year to build. Yes, this took one year to build. One year to build all these compartments and grids and bits and pieces. This is a, looks like a cassette and a track right there with the lenses. Very, very, very primitive compared to what we have now. So we're going to watch Invention of the Digital Camera, Steve Sassoon. My name is Steven Sassen, and I invented the, the digital camera. To take a picture, I would pick it up, and um, I would take the, uh, the camera, and we had to build a switch right here, and it had two positions. The first one uh, turned power on to the camera, where all the electronic ca would turn on, and then the second one would grab the picture. And then after the picture was grabbed, it was read out at, at, in about 50 milliseconds and digitized and stored in a digital memory card, which was contained down here. And so it was captured then, but it wasn't stored then. I needed a more permanent form of storage. And so the only more permanent form of digital storage I had available to me at the time was a digital cassette. And it took about 23 seconds to record and the tape would hold 30 images, a number I chose, by the way, to be conveniently between 24 and 36. I didn't want to store just one or two images on there because then they'd say, well, that's not very useful. I didn't want to store 100 or 1,000 images on there because nobody knew how to deal with that concept. See, the key, I think, when you're putting across an idea is you have to understand the culture you're dealing with first and foremost and put everything very much like the cultures used to, and then put your idea, only the, the essential elements of your idea out there so that it doesn't get, get confused with things that it might complicate the concept. I took the first picture in December of 1975. I was asked many times how long this would take before it affected consumer perception. I used Moore's Law and the assumption that a consumer, cam a consumer would be happy with two million pixels worth of, a, of an image. Might seem silly now, but that seemed like a big number back then. And I came up with 15 or 20 years. The options the average person has today for imaging is um, un unlimited. Uh, you walk around with your cell phone or your digital camera today, and the pictures are excellent. They're uh, reliably produced. You can share them instantly. I like to say to inventors that uh, uh, be aware that your invention is in an environment where the rest of the world is inventing along with you. And so by the time the idea matures, it'll be in a totally different world. I think that was the case with the digital camera. Okay. So, yes, Sasson, he. He made a point to say what you, the rest of the world is developing and inventing along with you. So when you have ideas, once things come to fruition, eventually the world that you were originally creating for and with and in will have long pass. And so the timeline for the camera stretched forward. We have much more sleek units than we see there today as as you understand things undergo evolution things move forward technology is always moving forward that's go forward so sasson had a concept of disruptive innovation what is disruptive innovation it refers to the innovations and technologies that make expensive or sophisticated products and services accessible and more affordable to the broader market so his 
invention of the digital camera disrupted the film industry. It laid the foundation for future, future digital cameras. It improved early models. Later improvements began to dominate the market. People stopped using film, so analog film changed to digital, which is electric data, and it marked a new divide in knowledge and skill sets. So before, you would have to understand how to develop film, go into a dark room, go through the development process, the pro and different processes that we've talked on in previous weeks. And now we need to know what's data? How do I save my image? Where is my image saved? It's, it's, it's collected, but now where do I store this data? Digital cameras in the 1980s. So Japanese companies compete to develop on Sasson's original model. And Nikon QV 1000C in 1988 was Nikon's first electronic camera. It was in black and white. And the test image was saved on a two inch insertable floppy disk. Floppy disk no longer exists. If you see a floppy disk, wow. So there, there's no more units to even put floppy disk in. The camera, te the camera technology and the computer technology has moved well beyond this, but this was a prototypal um, saving device that was inserted into the camera. Japanese companies, so Fuji, Fuji Film. Fujifilm made Fuji X DS-1P in 1988 as well. So the same year, they are both developing at the same time, Nikon and Fuji. And it's the world's first fully digital camera. Some people say, well, Nikon had the, the digital camera. Some people say, well, Fujifilm had the, the, the first digital camera with the memory card, was the ones we use today. So some may argue Nikon was first, some may argue that Fuji was first. And this unit was the world's first camera to save data in a semiconductor memory card. And that was noted at the Photo Kinda Show in 1988 in Germany. So that was a big deal. People didn't like the floppy disk. People wanted something sleek. Memory cards are still around today. Floppy disks are not. So we kind of see who won, even if it, even if Fuji wasn't first necessarily, or if they were um, concurrently developing at the same time, it's not about who was first, it's actually about who lasts. And where we seen innovative competition in, in photography before. So the early weeks, Daguerre versus Talbot, who was published first? Well, it was Daguerre with the daguerreotype. Talbot was published later. However, his issues with patenting, making it easily available across the seas and in other parts of the world allowed daguerreotype to take off. However, Talbot's film process, his early film process is as close as we have to making film today. So he was a pioneer in a different way. His innovations actually went forward to us later on. Okay, so how today's digital camera sensors convert light into an image. I had to find this clip. It is so intricate, but it's so important to understand how we went from the early camera obscura to this.
With over 70 years of know-how and technological expertise, Canon continues to produce high-quality, user-friendly cameras to ensure good photographs. It's vital to understand how light is captured and recorded. Like the human eye, a digital camera captures an object in the form of light through its lens. An image sensor, like the retina of the eye, then reads the light as an image. Finally, an image processor converts the image into a photograph. Digital cameras are made up of many parts. They must work in precise synchronization to produce good photographs. This feat is made possible by Canon's camera manufacturing expertise. To capture light without distortion, multiple lenses must be combined and precisely aligned. To design a lens, Canon conducts tens of thousands of simulations involving everything from the type of materials used to the order and arrangement of lens components. Next, 3D computer-aided design is used to design the entire lens. Lens production begins with the polishing of each piece of glass. Essential know-how regarding polishing methods, polishing times, and polishing abrasives can only be gained through many years of trial and error. Lenses are polished thousands of times and then washed. Following careful inspection, the lens surface is coated to reduce reflection and protect against scratching. The finished lens is so precise that if enlarged to the size of the Tokyo Dome Stadium, the margin of error would be less than the thickness of a business card. Canon's polishing tools are made by master craftsmen with decades of experience. It's here that traditional craftsmanship meets leading edge technology. Canon innovation is the history of the camera lens. Canon mass-produced fluorite, an ideal lens material. Introduced aspherical lenses. Achieved the first practical application of an ultrasonic motor. And developed optical image stabilization technology. Canon's breakthroughs in lens technology have redefined photography time and time again. In the ongoing pursuit of the ideal lens, Canon illuminates photography for future generations. The image sensor converts light entering through the lens into electrical signals. Canon applies its original technologies and know-how to develop high-precision image sensors that offer high-speed processing and low power consumption. Each pixel stores tens of thousands of electrons. This has made possible a digital revolution in astrophotography. Canon produces its image sensors in a clean room environment in which even a single speck of dust is unacceptable and the sensors do not come into contact with outside air. Using a method similar to semiconductor chip production, micrometer order circuits are etched onto large disk-like silicon wafers. Each sensor is cut from the wafer. After bonding and other processes, the sensor unit is complete. 
Canon's entirely automated production process ensures that each delicate image sensor meets the strictest standards of quality. Canon has nurtured its sensor technology since the beginning, and now it's flourishing. After the image sensor converts the image data into electrical signals, the image processor processes it. Canon's 70 years of camera making experience led to the creation of the powerful Digic image processor. Digic narrows the gap between human color perception and a camera's objective measurement of color, producing colors beautiful to the human eye. Canon's research into seamless communication between cameras and printers is incorporated into Digic circuitry. Today's digital cameras can recognize facial expressions such as smiles and winks and identify over 30 faces at once. Canon digital SLR cameras support high-speed continuous shooting and were first to make possible the shooting of full high-definition movies thanks to their ability to instantly process large amounts of data. To create high-precision images, Digic performs countless processes, all in the instant you press the shutter. So that was an exceptional video on just some of the ways that these image processors, lenses, electrical circuits come together in order to make the digital cameras that we have today. And this is just the cameras that we hold with in our hands. There's a whole set of digital cameras that are in phones, the digital cameras that I'm talking to you through the internet using right now, but just the ones that we hold in our hands, the ones that photographers use, traditional photographers use, is highly intricate and highly scientific. So understanding the technology of the 1980s, so I'm gonna go back to the 1980s. It was bulky, had a lot of components. It was hand-built or lab-derived like Sasson's original digital camera and it was cutting edge for the time so we see a camcorder with its vcr unit exposed there used to be camcorders where you put a vcr large vcr cassette tape in the side hit record and it would record onto the uh cassette the vcr cassette uh here is an apple II with a 6502 processor running at one megahertz so an apple computer it, it 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 blows my mind to see these these archaic pieces of technology cuz we have advanced so quickly and so far beyond uh the original origins fax machines predated email sent messages and images along landlines to anywhere in the country in seconds you type in their phone number load the document press send, it pull it through, convert the images and the numbers or information to data, sent it along the line, and it was received by another fax machine on the end that you had dialed in the, in the first place. So that was, that was pre-email. And uh, analog cell phones were made in 1983 when the FCC approved amps as the standard. So that is a cell phone, early cell phone with a long antenna, heavy, very heavy, but we have the old dinosaurs from before and we have the evolution of the mobile phone. So the large units slowly became smaller, sleeker, some twisted and turned, the screens opened up. Then we have the flat screen, ones with buttons, and the various other brands. So 
cell phones have evolved, computers have evolved, cameras have evolved. Cell phones now have cameras. If you didn't know, now you know. You can take pictures on your cell phone, put them on your social media platforms, send them to people via text. It's very high tech. We have me cameras the size of, I say a macaroon or a marshmallow, has night vision, motion detection, wide angle lenses, loop record, and you can record while charging. And that previous large desktop has now been modified to the sleek portable laptop. Things have changed and we don't, we, if you weren't living in the 80s or in the early 90s, when the phases of these products were going through its evolution, you would have never known what these things had looked like. Okay, so we're going to go to the 1980s photo culture. A lot of this is film. Some of it is early digital, color film, black and white film. As people had to grasp the new technologies, they still had access to the previous technologies. And so we're going to talk about the culture that was captured in the 1980s on cameras. So Jamel Shabazz, he is a New York City native who grew up among the five boroughs. And he took a lot of images of the 1980s hip hop culture as it was coming out of New York City. So this one is called Young Blood, taken in 1982. The boom box was a popular portable music device. Like how we have our speakers today, they had boom boxes and they put their cassettes in and they played their music. Determination. So he showed how children, even if they were impoverished, they had fun and made fun with whatever they had around them. So this boy is doing a flip on a beat up mattress in a, looks like a store parking lot. So children learned how to entertain themselves. There was less tech as we know it today. More children were outside. This is called Determination 1980. Double Trouble in 1981. Shabazz took pictures of African-American populations in New York City, as well as Puerto Rican and Dominican communities. Their communities on the East Coast are highly mixed, have been mixed from the beginning, and he took pictures of everyone. Crack kills in 1985, there had been a drug epidemic, and so people put up murals advising youth, children, and even adults to not engage in drug use. It was a very big deal in that time. Many people in the community were lost to drug addiction. And Shabazz really showed for that time what the community needed to do for themselves and what to stay away from. Rush Hour 1988, the trains, they show the youth that America at that time would have considered down and out drug dealers or drug doers. He portrayed them in a positive fashion. He brought humanity to the people in these urban cities, urban environments where none had been afforded to these people previously. C, 1982, the gentleman on the right in black and white, Fashion, New York fashion, it was the genesis of the hip hop fashion, the urban cool fashion, what was in, it was coming out of New York, period. No one, no one was doing fashion like the East Coast, inspiring the layered look, the puffy winter jacket with the clear glasses, the chains around the neck with the belt buckle. No one was doing it like New York. Bittersweet. He showed people in their family life, everyday life. This is quintessential 1980s clothing. Everyone's wearing shorts. There's neon. There's stripes. It was something very interesting to have lived through, seen, and he was sure to document it at the time that he was in the city growing up. J 
Jeanette Beckman. She also took pictures in the 1980s culture. So these two are the rock steady crew, New York City, 1983 break dancing, hip hop break dancing, street culture, Adidas, and other Reebok brands such as Reebok Adidas. They were very popular. The Kango hat, it was all coming out of New York City. It was very fresh and new at the time. Beckman took pictures of ultramagnetic MCs, so gentlemen that performed as MCs, disc jockeys, break dancers, rappers, performers. This is 1989. You can see it'd be considered dated what they're wearing, but at the time, everyone was wearing that. It was what the youth were wearing, it was what the young adults thought was in. She also took pictures of the punk scene. So there was two contingent music movements, the punk scene in London, England, also the hip hop scene. Very different. Both musical genres scared adults. It, whatever the kids were into, the adults were like, mm, too loud, too raucous, too weird. Jack Pearson also took pictures of the party scenes of New York City. So this gentleman has a cigarette. We don't know his identity. He is shrouded in shadow and the light carves out the back of his neck, his chest. He has a cigarette. It's billowing smoke goes into the curtain. It was very dramatic, very simple black and white photography that Pearson had made. He worked heavily with the use of light on his subjects, and it shows them as they really are, not how we would wish them to be. So taking a step back, how does technology influence narrative? So going to today, there is a show based on the lives of high schoolers. It was aired in 2019, created by Sam Levinson, and the cinematographer is Marcel Rev. Marcel Rev adopts ectochrome approach for euphoria in pursuit of a nostalgic view. So they had previously used digital filming and had moved to ectochrome film in order to put this continuing series together. So Zendaya Coleman as Rue Bennett, Euphoria season one on the left and season two on the right. Levinson emphasizes that switching formats and designing a specific film oriented approach for season two not only didn't distract from a look that fans might have been comfortable with from the first season, but rather the move fulfilled the visual mission that he and Rev have always pursued. That mission, according to Levinson, is to be an emotional expression before a logical one. So our approach for this year was to make the show look like a reflection of a memory or something we're looking back upon. And for us, those memories all started on film. So you can see the clear difference. Zendaya Coleman on the left, season one, the images are Crisper, clearer, her skin tone is a uh, natural skin tone for herself on the right. You see it is slightly distorted by the grain of the film. You see in her jacket around her face. And of course, lighting also helps to have these effects of memory too. But there is a clear difference between the digital film and the analog film. So Alexis 65 with ARRI prime DNA lenses, that was what season one was filmed with. It was digital. It had crisp imagery and realistic color range. So that's Alexa Demi performing. There's a GIF of her, it loops around. You can see that the subjects in the frame are lit with natural light. Their skin tones are natural. The images are crisp and clear. 
There is not much distortion to go on. However, if you compare to season two with Codex Ectochrome 529.4 format, which was made specifically for this show, is brought back and mixed with Kodak Vision 3 500T color negative film in the 5219 series. This film and this combination of film and shooting, it has a hazed or satin finish to the skin. Alexa Demi is seen here lying on a bed. They're zooming in. Everything is pastel or in muted tones. Not only by color choice, but because the grain of the film makes the skin look soft, plush, pillowy as compared to the side-by-side -side comparison with season one. There's a more dramatic effect in season two on the right. Hence what Rev and Levinson were going for, had originally been going for, but decided to slowly switch it up as season two spoke more about memories and recollections of the past from the character's parents to moving from one city to another and how things have changed in their personal dynamics and relationships. So here's some more images, really beautifully shot for TV. Uh, I watched this Euphoria series on my computer and it is, it is just as good as watching it on a large screen TV. It feels cozy and intimate. The lighting and the colors, the film gives it a, a lived in feeling like you, you are there yourself. Her skin looks like skin. You can see the detail in her hair. It's also cost, uh, costume design and set design as well that helps set up these shots. But you can have a beautiful set and very terrible uh, film, filming, filming style. Uh, and it could really disturb the audience from getting connected to the narrative in the series. And here is some more shots from Euphoria season two, the one that's shot in the film. You can see the grain and the texture on this kid's face in the background. It looks vintage and it, it, it looks like a memory of a life that you've lived or you've heard someone recall and tell back to you, okay? So here's my sources. And next week, we're gonna be talking about neo-individualism versus the community versus the media's gaze. So we're moving on to the 1990s. Even though this image was taken in 1985, it caused a complete landslide in how taking pictures of other people and other cultures and other parts of the world from a Western view, how people changed their views on what they thought other people and other cultures lived like. Okay, so before we go to questions, I wanna let you guys know I've updated one through six on my YouTube page. So youtube.com forward slash at Imani Haddon Photography. If you've missed any of the series or if you want to listen to it again, watch it again, like, share, subscribe. It's there for us to all watch. I'll keep them up. It's going to be permanently up. I'm not going to take them down. So it's going to be a permanent part of uh, my fixture for my community outreach. I also may want to watch them over again for myself too. So if you missed any, I'll be putting up week seven, this week's, shortly after I'm done filming. So we can all go watch it back. Questions, anybody, questions? I, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Okay. I 
Let's start the video. I typically don't think of hip hop cultures, the music scene when I mm -hmm. think of photography. So that was an interesting meshing of photography to that genre of music and that style and that era. Mm -hmm. um, how do they juxtapose or, or bring music scene and photography together is, is it used to make it more acceptable? What was the use of photography in hip hop or in music, the music scene? I know fashion, they tend to, you know, fashion photography, mm -hmm. but how is it, how is it used? I'm trying to see how that, that applies or how they applied it. Oh, at, at that time, Shabazz was simply documenting his everyday lived experience. I don't think he was necessarily thinking, oh, yeah, in, in 30 years, this is going to be, you know, something different. It's going to blow up because hip hop was wildly unpopular at the time it was coming out. Like how now we have like hip hop jingles and commercials or like people rapping on phone commercials. It was not like that when it first came out. And so I think with Shabazz walking around his neighborhood and just taking pictures like, oh, that guy looks cool. I'm gonna take a picture of you. Oh, those could do those two kids are stylish. I'm gonna take a picture. I think he was simply documenting. Just just he was in he was in the right place in the right time. And he had a camera at the right place and right time. And he was just making imagery. Imagery that other people were not making, other people were not thinking to make to go into the boroughs in New York and to take pictures of who was there. Many people didn't care. Uh, it's urban, it's different, it's strange. There's nothing there. The people are uh, uneducated or you know they have all these sorts of concepts and ideas about people that are not from the suburbs. And so he took it upon himself to take images of what he saw and, and people he knew, and it turned out to be a time capsule. So it was an unintended time capsule. All images are unintended time capsules, but that one in particular was the origin or the genesis of the hip hop movement that, it, that exploded. And now it's, it's almost everywhere. It's almost everywhere. And almost everywhere and nowhere at the same time. Mm -hmm. It was- okay. It was different, but he was the first to do it. Okay, he was good. There. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any other questions, comments about anything in the today's series? So you're moving on to the 90s. So that's going to be slightly different than the 80s. Yeah. Yes. Slightly different. I'm I've noticed just from what I've I've been pulling up just uh different concepts and ideas. There was a lot of um music mania, but there were some photographers at the time that really blew up. I'm going to talk about Steve McCurry who made that previous image of the girl, uh, the Afghani girl, as it was called in 1985. And that image got a lot of traction through the 90s because Americans and Westerners had not been exposed to uh, Middle Eastern culture. And it's understood um, in, Middle, in Middle Eastern cultures and Muslim cultures that women cover their faces. And so, Steve McCurry went to Afghanistan and he had asked the lady, I'll get her name in for next week, but he asked the lady to uncover her face. And she said, yes, only if my husband allows me. And so the husband was like, sure, I, okay. You know, she asked me and I'm okay with it. And so that was the, considered one of the first images of a Middle Eastern woman uncovered it was a very big deal a lot of people did not like it it was um considered intrusive and so it's like new individualism of like the western ideas and views being centered around the self versus the community 
versus the media looking at the individual, looking at the group. So I want to talk about how photography goes between the individual, the community, and the media, and how it interplays with each other throughout the three. Yeah, that's for next week in the 90s. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Any questions? Anything you found interesting? Okay. Well, that was that was a segue from the earlier technologies. I have to talk about digital. Digital was and is still today where people are making most of their interactions with each other, themselves, and the greater network of the world. So from the 90s on Ronnie? down to, yes. Oh, yes. You're cutting in and out a little bit. That joy. I'll wait for a moment. Let's see if she could. Let's see. Joy. Joy's cutting in and out. Ah, see, she's connecting to audio. Hello. Oh, sorry. That. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi. Can you Hi. hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Sorry. You know, you know how it is. I'm constantly going in. And out. So, um, I just wanted to bring up. It's interesting that you're going to cover about uh, the photography uh, of the Afghan young lady on the cover next week because right now the culture between the Middle East and America, people are fussing and arguing over mm. the, um, their, their, um, their way of life in Qatar for the FIFA Cup, which mm. is the Middle East, of course, versus America and how the Middle East is like, you guys, you could have whatever it is that you believe in with the, with the um, gay rights and transgender and all that stuff. But when you come here, you've got to also respect our culture. Mm. So it's just interesting how you're talking about that. And that's what's going on in the Middle East versus America and how, you know, America, you know, how in general, it's like, okay, go to a country and okay, I'm going to just be who I am. Mm -hmm. That's what America is saying. They're like, well, that's fine. But you also have to respect when you're over here, what we are just like, you know, I guess they were saying they respect here. So I thought it was really interesting that um, you're going to bring that up uh, next week and how there was such a, um, astonishment and it wasn't favorable in the Middle East when that that uncovering of the young lady happened in photography. So I just wanted to yeah. um, mention because you mentioned what you find interesting. So I thought that I found that interesting. Oh, but again, your you. your presentation is always absolutely beautiful. Thank you thank for you. everything. You're, you're I'm learning a lot from you. Yes, thank, thank you. you. You're welcome. Yeah, going off of what Joy said in um, Cutter currently, they have banned the selling of alcohol in the stadium and people that are coming to Qatar to watch the World Cup are very upset because they want their beer, they want their pretzels, but Qatar is a traditional Muslim country. Alcohol is forbidden. So many people are like, yes, we respect Islam. We understand. We will drink water. We will drink juice. We will drink tea. We will drink soda, maybe. But a lot of other people are like, no, this is a stadium. We're used to drinking alcohol. So there is, there's, there's always this um, bubbling and divide about um, culture versus custom versus what people expect to happen versus what people want to happen as the outcome. So yeah, it's... I'm always watching the news and I'm going, wow, why can't we just comply? Drink some water, watch some FIFA. 
it's it's nice to not have a drunken brawl in the stadiums all the time if people are not drinking alcohol it'd be, it'd be nice but yeah people people are always butting heads cultures and what the expectations are and photography oftentimes captures that any more questions for anybody comments okay allowing anybody any comments okay well everyone thank you for joining me i will See you guys next week for the covering of the 90s. Have a good evening.